beautiful girls. How are you? Hi, I'm Yvette Manessis Corporan, and I am a journalist and an author. I'm a daughter of Greek immigrants. My grandparents were born and raised in a tiny little Greek island called Erikusa, which is off the coast of Corfu. I grew up listening to my grandmother's stories about what life was like during World War II. And one of her stories that really stood out to me was how during World War II, my grandmother and the rest of the islanders, it was a very small island, there maybe were about 200 people on the island, they all worked together to hide and save a Jewish man and his family from the Nazis during the German occupation. Truly, all I had was, you know, the basics. Uh, my grandmother told me the name of this man. I knew his name was Savis. At the time, I did not know his last name. I knew that he was a tailor. I knew that he lived and worked on the main island of Corfu in the Jewish quarter, and that my grandmother and the rest of the islanders became friends with him when they would take a little boat from Erikusa to the main island of Corfu whenever they could scrape together enough money for a new article of clothing or to mend an article of clothing. And I knew that he had daughters that my grandmother became very close with, Nina, Spera, and Julia, and also that there was a little granddaughter, and her name was Rosa. She would tell me what it was like when the family would come to her and she would take food off of her own plate and her own children's plate to feed her friends, and what it was like when the Nazis came searching door to door looking for this Jewish family, and everyone on the island knew the risk, they knew the threat, the Nazis had warned them again and again, we will kill you, we will burn down this entire island if we find that you're helping Jews. And they did it anyway. It's said that when they opened up the train cars, when they arrived at Auschwitz, there was barely anybody left alive. Most of them didn't even survive the journey there. Of the 1,800 that were sent to Auschwitz, only about 200 survived. And a handful of them returned to Corfu afterwards. So, I mean, it's truly just a horrific and tragic story. And what I learned is that Savas and his family managed to escape because they lived just outside the Jewish quarter. So when the Nazis were rounding up the rest of the community, it gave Savas and his girls a little extra time in order to make it away from Corfu town, get to a boat and make it to Erikusa. This story from so many years ago, from this little tiny place, from an uneducated woman, I decided that I'd put my investigative journalist hat on and I would really truly focus on digging in and finding out what happened to Savas and his girls. I knew that they survived the war. I knew at the time that Savas died on Erikusa immediately after the war, and his family wanted him buried there, so they buried him just outside the Christian cemetery gate. And I knew that the girls survived, Spera, Julia, Nina, and little Rosa, but I didn't know what happened to them. We knew that um, some of the girls might have gone to Athens uh, and worked and made a living as seamstresses there, the skills they learned from their father. And we knew that some of the girls might have gone to Israel, but we didn't really know what happened to them. And that's when I decided to really dig in and focus my energy on finding them. On my family vacations, I would go and drag my husband with me. And we literally went door to door in the Jewish quarter, knocking on doors, asking people, do you, have you heard the story of Savas? Do you know of his girls? Did you hear about the Islanders of Erikosa and what they did? Have you heard from them? Do you know where they are? And it was again and again, it was crickets. Nobody knew anything. So I reached out to the researchers at Yad Vashem, and I wrote what little I knew. I said, I know that there was a situation on the island of Erikusa. There was a man named Savas. He was a tailor. He was from Corfu. These are the names. Can you help me? Do you have any record? And they told me that, yes, you know, two of the girls did end up in Israel. We found out that Spera and Rosa did manage to make it to Israel. But then again, the trail went cold. I got an email at work and my job is a TV producer. And it said, there is this company, they do incredible research in, in genealogy. And that was the beginning of an incredible chain of events that changed so many lives, including my own. A few days later, I get an email from Aaron Godfrey at MyHeritage, and Aaron tells me that, yes, they are going to try to help me, and if I could please share any information. So I type up an email to Aaron, and in it, I, you know, put what little information I had in there. And I also had one additional name at this point. Yad Vashem told me that Spera had married a man named Victorio Mustaki, and they did, in fact, make it to Israel. So Aaron then gave my information, all the information, to Gilad Yafet, who is the CEO and founder of MyHeritage. And Gilad is not only a gifted genealogist, but he's been called the Sherlock Holmes of genealogy. Aaron was in touch 
And he told me that there is some unique story and it involves as a quest for missing people who disappeared 70 years ago. And uh, I was quite intrigued by this. And he told me that several people from the company are on it. And I asked him to, to keep, keep me posted. And um, the traces led to the city of Rehovot. And so I kept asking him, what's, what's up with this Rehovot story? Um, there was specifically a search for a woman. And um, I kept asking him, what's, what's up with that story? And at some point, he told me, we are not successful. It's a dead end. And I told him, you know, why don't you send me the details and I may want to give it a try myself, see if I can find something. And it looked like a very long shot, a very difficult quest. So I remember telling him that it looks like the chances for success are less than 0.1%. Boy, did he live up to his name because he only had one full name. At that point, I only had one full name. I knew the name Victoria Mustaki, and he was a gentleman that Spera married uh, and came to Israel with. And that was the only full name that Gilad had at the time. But he took that name and he ran with it. Detectives like me, you know, his, you know historical detectives, we have a sixth sense for names. Um, we have a very strong intuition for names. And when I saw the name Spera, and rumor has it that she had immigrated to Israel. And I just knew that she would not have kept the name Spera in Israel because nobody goes by that name. A lot of times when people come to Israel, they change their name to something close to the original. And so I was trying to guess what is the origin of the name Spera. And I had a wild guess because there was no information about that name on the internet that Spera might be a nickname of Esperanza in Spanish, or speranza in Italian, which means hope. And I think hope is the most important word in this whole story. I never gave up hope of trying to find her. And um, the name hope is very popular as a first name in many cultures, even in Israel. So I knew what hope means in many languages. And so my hunch was that she had changed the name to Tikva, which is the Hebrew version of hope, when she came to Israel. So he started searching. He looked through documents, ships manifests, any documents that he could find to see if there was a tikva that came to Israel from Greece after the war. So he took a map of Israel and he mapped where he found all the sparrows that came from Greece and all the roses that came from Greece. Well, wouldn't you know it, there was a tiny street in Tel Aviv and on this street, he mapped both of them. There was a sparrow and there was a rosa just down the street from each other. And he realized that if the girls came over and had survived such trauma and tragedy and finally made it to Israel, wouldn't they want to live near one another? And so then he zeroed in on the Spera and the Rosa who lived on this tiny street in Tel Aviv, found family members, and that's when we had the real breakthrough. Galad was able to find the family of Tikva, who we knew as Spera, and he tracked them to Los Angeles and actually found a granddaughter who lived in Los Angeles. So I'm sitting in the car one afternoon after my daughter's dance recital, and I get an email from Galad saying, I hope you're sitting down, but I think we found the family of Spera, and she lives in Los Angeles. And of course, I was, you know, a lunatic at this point. I couldn't believe it. I'm hyperventilating. I'm so excited. And I looked further at his email and he said, not only does she live in Los Angeles, but she works in television like I do. So after all this time, our worlds had not only come together, but they had collided. You know, when you dream and wish of something, it actually comes true. You can't even believe it actually happened and it's real. And that was kind of the out of body experience at the time. It was incredibly emotional and incredibly powerful. And then of course it was like, okay, well, what next? What do I even say to this woman? How do you tell someone you've been searching for for so many years? Hey, you know, my grandmother's the one who saved your grandmother. I sent the details of Michelle and I, I was tempted to give her a call. But I thought I'm only a small part of the story. And uh, this is really Yvette's story. And that Yvette should call Michelle. I was a little confused because I didn't know what was happening. Um, you know, she had sent me an email also that said that our grandmothers might have known each other, which sparked my interest because I'd always been looking for my history and who we were and who I was. Um, I come from a great mix on both sides and it always interested me. Um, but a lot of skepticism as to what this is even about. 
I heard initially the excitement of her assistant who wouldn't let me off the phone, even put me on hold. She was just screaming Yvette's name down the hall. So I knew there was something going on. I just wasn't clear as to what it was. And then Yvette got on the phone and you could already hear sort of the emotion in her voice. It was an amazing conversation. You know, where do you even begin? So I began with, you know, I think our grandmothers were friends and, you know, we have reason to believe that my grandmother um, helped hide and save your grandmother on this tiny Greek island. And, you know, and Michelle was like, um, okay, I don't know this story, but yes, Spera is my grandmother and she, you know, went by the name of Tikva. And yes, there was some Greek history and, you know, we don't really know what happened or where she was during the Holocaust. And then I mentioned, well, did she, you know, did she ever mention someone named Rosa? And Michelle said, yes, there was a Rosa. And the moment that she said the word Rosa, I knew that there might be some connection because that's a name that I had heard um, throughout, you know, from my grandmother and in our family. I had no concept of who this person was or what it was. It just seemed like too much of a coincidence that that name would come up on her end. And I kind of filled in the blanks and said, well, you know, I grew up listening to this story. This is what my grandmother told me. And Michelle was shocked. She was, it was a very emotional phone call um, because there had been so many questions from her own family. And she had meant so many times to ask her grandmother these questions and flesh out their family's history, but she never did. And she never got the chance to. And then Sparrow passed away and there was a big question mark. No one ever really knew what happened. And so in this initial phone call, the pieces of the puzzle started coming together. Yvette and I had multiple conversations after that, but, and I had found some pictures. Um, so, and there were pictures that I had never had context to. My mother had some, um, but she had some context that it was from Tikva's family. So that's what I called Yvette back and, and sent her and said, I don't know who these children are. I don't know exactly who this man is in the picture, but I think we have some feeling that this has to do with Tikva's family. Michelle also told me that, yes, she was Spera's granddaughter, but she was Spera's step-granddaughter. Spera had married a widower with three children, and she raised those children as her own. So yes, Spera was Michelle's grandmother, but there was still this drive for us to find blood relatives, people who are alive today because of what happened on Erikusa. So in further digging into our story, Galad later found out that Rosa was actually not Spera's granddaughter. It's an incredibly tragic story, um, but Galad and the researchers at MyHeritage were able to finally uh, solve the mystery of who Rosa truly was. Savas told everyone on Erikusa that Rosa was his granddaughter, but that wasn't actually the case. What we later found out is that Rosa's entire family was taken and murdered by the Nazis. And so... In order to keep Rosa safe and keep her with his family, Savas told everyone that Rosa was his granddaughter when actually she was a distant cousin. Rosa must have been about nine or 10 years old when all of that happened. And then she immigrated to Israel. And um, I didn't know who she married, if she married. And uh, I didn't even know her maiden name. Because even if the last name was indeed Israel, of Julia Spera and Nina, it wasn't Rosa's maiden name. So I had no maiden name, I, I had nothing. And I wanted very much to find her. And this is when I had a lot of help because speaking with Michelle, it turned out that the family knows Rosa. And in fact, it was a bit tragic that we were a few years late and that she passed away quite, quite recently, only a few years earlier. And then came the best news of all that Rosa had to boys who are living in Israel. Gilad then took that information and was able to track down Rosa's sons, Avraham and Peretz. And since I don't speak Hebrew, Gilad reached out and gave them a call. Hey! Hi. Hi. Hi, guys. I, I'm sitting here with, uh, on my left or your right is uh, Avraham. And on my right to the left is Peretz. Um, Hi. This is uh, their family who's with us today. Um, and of course, Gilad is here. I'm... 
I was in New York uh, in my office in this high rise in Manhattan. And on the other side of the video, there was um, Gilad and Aaron, you know, in Avraham's appointment in Rehovot, Israel, talking about this story and getting, you know, having the opportunity to actually meet them. And the emotions were just overwhelming. היא שואלת אם אתם יודעים משהו על הסיפור של ההסתרה של רוזה? לא. מעט מאוד. They know very very little about that. They're, like you found out with uh, the other person, they don't talk much about what happened. תסביר לה שהאימא לא הייתה מדברת על זה הרבה. Their mother wouldn't talk about this a lot. And not only that, we were... You know, in the apartment, I could see the apartment, I could see the men, and then on the walls, the walls were filled with family photos of this family that I had been searching for forever. There was one picture hanging in the corridor that I immediately recognized was Savas, because he had a very manly mustache, and you, you can't miss him. But it was a young version of Savas. Uh, we had found an older version of him, and I believe Michelle had sent us. So we immediately recognized that this was a younger version of Savas, and I asked the, the brothers, this is fantastic, do you know who this person is? And they said, no. And then we said, this is Savas. Do you know who Savas is? And they said, well, we've heard the name, because any time, every year when we went to the cemetery, to pay our respects at uh, Nina's yard site, which is the anniversary of her, of her death, we were requested to say Kaddish also on Savas, but we had no idea who that person was. And, and I said, this is Savas, he's hanging on your corridor, this is him, and he was Nina's father, and Spera's father, and also uh, a distant ancestor of, of yours, in fact. Yvette, I don't hear you, but you're going to have to see something that we're bringing to the webcam now. But she sent a photo of him with his entire family. This was a really incredible and powerful um, experience for all of us. Um, you know, we knew Spera did not talk about the war and what happened to her and how she survived the Holocaust was a mystery. And that's incredibly powerful and meaningful. But Rosa's story, if you can imagine, was even more so because it, let's not forget, Rosa was around nine years old when the Holocaust happened and when she lost her entire family and when she was taken and saved on at Iquisa. Rosa never talked about the Holocaust. Not only that, she was deeply, deeply wounded um, and scarred by her experiences. And she never told her sons what happened. She never told her sons why there were no family members or why no one else survived. And she never told her sons how she survived. I think one of the most powerful stories they told me was that on Holocaust Remembrance Day, Rosa had them stay in the house and pray and be mournful and thoughtful and pray for the family members that were lost in the Holocaust. And they would, but they said they never knew who they were praying for. And it wasn't until that video conference call when we told them and explained how their mother was saved and how her family was lost that their family's story started to fall into place. So that first video meeting with Avraham and Peretz was just um, one of the most extraordinary moments of my life. It was really just surreal to meet these two men who were alive because of what my grandmother did and what everyone on Irikusa did, and to see that good deeds matter. These, these two gentlemen who are, are alive today because of what happened on that island. And with the help of my heritage, we were able to bring everyone to Irikusa for a truly magical experience. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Hello. Hi. Oh, oh hello. Oh. Beautiful girls, how are you? <laughs> She said nobody here would let them go hungry. Whatever we could do to help them, to give them food, we would do.
If they were very good people, good people, whatever we could do to help them, we would. I mean, there was a river of tears that day, the emotions that day. We all took a little tiny boat from Corfu together and made it to the shores of Irikusa. Um, and to be there as Rosa's and Sparrow's family stepped off this boat and onto Irikusa and were able to meet the islanders, um, some of whom were still alive today, who remembered Spera and Rosa, who were there when it happened, to see them embrace and meet these islanders, these people who helped save their mothers and grandmothers. Um, it was unbelievable. I don't think there are any words, and I have a big mouth, and I, even I am at a loss for words sometimes to describe the emotions of that day. Oh my God! <laughs> No words. Like of... And then we had a ceremony um, just outside of the church. And it was amazing. We were able to show them where Savas was buried, just outside of the, of the cemetery gate. This is the grave of Savas Israel. Yeah. He was originally buried on the island of Arikusa. And then the family went back and removed the bones. He died in 1944 on the island. They removed the bones and reinterred him here. Unfortunately, my grandmother passed away years before I even started the search. Um, and so she was not there with us, but she was there in spirit. Uh, I was actually able to take Rosa and Sparrow's families to visit my grandmother's grave. And that was really meaningful. For so many years, the story had no ending. Uh, and now our story has an ending, and it is the most beautiful ending. Um, you know, I'm a writer, but I'm not that good a writer. I don't think I could make this up. So it's the most beautiful ending I could imagine. Abraham, Peretz, Michelle, Hedva, everyone, I know that you will grow to love this island as much as I do. I know you already do. I hope that you spend as many magical summers as I did here. I hope this is the first of many visits. I hope to come back with you on a bigger boat <laughs> so we don't have any more seasickness. And I have one more thing to say to you. Anilo mita beret ivrit, but brohim chabaim chabaita. It's interesting because I've been asked so many times, you know, how and why, why would they do this? Why would your grandmother risk her life? Why would your grandmother risk her children's lives to save this family? And the answer is because it was the right thing to do. There's this word in Greek called philotimo, and philotimo is a word that is said has no translation, has no literal meaning in any other language. And, you know, the closest you can get to describing what philotimo is, is to say that you bring honor to yourself, to your family, by doing something good for others, by helping your friends, by helping your neighbors. And that truly kind of explains what happened on Erikusa. It was nothing more than Filotimo. <laughs> <laughs> 